Pain is one of this nation's most serious health problems. It is unquestionably a silent epidemic. Approximately 15% or 6 million people suffer chronic pain that interferes with quality of life and productivity and places a huge burden on our already strained health care system. In fact, more than half of the hospitalized patients in Canada suffer significant acute pain. Are they getting the help they need, or does modern medicine simply throw pain pills at them, setting these patients up for a cycle of dependency and no long-term relief? This is National Pain Awareness Week. We're joined today by Dr. Jeff Ennis, a psychiatrist and founder of the Ennis Center for Pain Management. And Dr. Ennis, you know of what you speak because not only are you a specialist in the field, but you've had to deal with chronic pain throughout your life. And, and how has that affected you? Uh, it's like the hair club for men. I'm not only the president, I'm a member. Um, it's had an impact on my entire life. Uh, my original direction in training was actually to be a surgeon and then I uh, got to the point where I actually couldn't stand up. I've had 15 surgeries to date, mm. uh, and I have another unusual disease that makes me quite ill. Uh, but it's directed me into my chosen area of medicine. As I told somebody, it's the only place that I can find that makes my problems useful. So I can do something useful with the misery I feel. Um, Dr. Ennis, I'm wondering, uh, you know, do you think doctors are too quick to write a prescription for pain pills without looking at alternatives? I mean, we have this Oxycontin issue, and uh, a lot of the people who started out taking uh, the pain medication because they had a chronic pain. Good question. Um, what we do know, for example, there was a very large study done. Um, it was a Danish study. It's an epidemiologic study, which means it looked at thousands and thousands of people. And the long and short of it was they discovered that after using these medicines for long periods of time, nothing much happens. People's function does not improve. In fact, those people who use these medicines typically do worse. Why? Uh, because I think that in our um, medical system, physicians are not really well trained in the management of chronic pain. Uh, I know that in undergrad medicine at McMaster, uh, the typical training for chronic pain is about two hours with me in their fourth year, hmm. and that's about it. Um, I'm wondering, too, and since Liz mentioned uh, uh, you know, synthetics, uh, prescription drugs, painkillers, um, a lot of people seem to be turning to marijuana for pain. Mm -hmm. uh, two questions. One, is it a natural analgesic, as some say? Uh, two, can it really be effective in pain management? Uh, the answer to the question is yes, both times. There was a, a nicely done study, actually, from Montreal to try to look at is marijuana useful for the management of chronic non-cancer pain? The short answer is yes. Uh, to date, it's early in the business, so we haven't compared it to anything else. I cannot tell you that marijuana is better or not better than if I use a Tylenol, by way of example. Hmm. But for the patients that I see who find it helpful, in my world, my rule is as long as you don't smoke it, uh, then I have no problem with helping people uh, use that if it helps them get up and uh, re-enter life. What, what's wrong with smoking it? Uh, the tar uh, content of smoked marijuana is worse than the tar content of a smoked cigarette. Uh, and I won't help people hurt themselves. Okay, let's talk about other alternatives because I know some people seek, uh, if you can afford it, acupuncture, physiotherapy, even meditation. But these things aren't covered by OHIP. And I always wonder, is the reason my doctor is not recommending I try it because OHIP's not covering it, therefore he can't suggest I go spend money in case I don't have it? Well, that's possible. I mean, each of those modalities have some place in the, in the armamentarium for treating pain. The gold standard for treating pain is what we call a multidisciplinary pain program. That's the program I run. Uh, there's another program like it in the city uh, at Shadok, and those are the only two. So there's very few. I'm not aware of any significant government funding. None's ever been made available to me anyway uh, to be able to set up more of those types of programs to help people with pain problems be able to have life again without having to go to their doc. And the easiest thing to do is to take a pill. Um, I know uh, of a few occasions where people have uh, defrauded the insurance industry. Um, not liberty to say, but someone who wasn't as injured as they said they were. Uh, has the insurance industry, they've warned that fraud's a major component of all the rising premiums, but I'm wondering if um, uh, um, fraud has to do with the treatment of pain. I mean, how can you tell when a patient really is, in effect, uh, in serious pain or when they're faking it? Good question again. Uh, there is no you know, objective test. There's no machine I can use to say, ah, this person really has it and this one doesn't. Uh, there's a large literature 
that in fact we're looking at now through my clinic on this business of what's called malingering. It's much more difficult to show that someone's malingering than people appreciate. The vast majority of people that I see are not faking. Uh, I think there's a different issue in the insurance industry, and that is that their goals are very simple. They want to pay as little money as possible and take as much money as they can. Uh, so one argument for them is that everyone's faking. It's a reversal of our justice system. If you get hit by a car today, you're going to be pr proven guilty until you're guilty until you can prove yourself innocent. Hmm. And that's the typical process that I see for people that I see. If they want to save money, they should stop spending thousands and thousands of dollars on assessments for the simple purpose of getting the answer that they would like. Right. Huh. Uh, doctor, you can speak from this personally as well as professionally. What happens uh, to someone's mental state once they've experienced uh, ongoing pain? And I don't know how long it takes to have a real effect, whether it's a month, six months, a year, or five years, but certainly some people have been suffering four years. What happens to you know, how you feel up here? Uh, well, God, you guys have good questions today. Um, I'll speak from myself a little bit and from the people I see. I've been dealing with problems since I've been 16, but I've watched my life physically erode uh, for a long, long time. And the core problem for most people is about loss. You, lose, you can lose everything. You can lose your capacity to work and suddenly all the roles that go with work, the people you know, uh, feeling like you're making a contribution, it's all gone. Uh, just to even get up in the morning and get dressed becomes a big deal. Uh, so it's really not surprising that people with chronic pain are at extremely high risk for having what, we, what I would call a major depression. One of the issues for me is that it's really underdiagnosed. Uh, I think a lot of people out there think, well, if I had chronic pain, I'd feel miserable too. Mm. So it's not treated. If you treat it, people with uh, pain and depression, if you just treat the depression alone, how much pain they feel actually reduces and their capacity to uh, function improves. Make, makes sense. Dr. Jeff Ennis is a psychiatrist. He's the founder of the Ennis Center for Pain Management. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we learned an awful lot today. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. All right, when we come back, why are some parents taking their kids out of Remembrance Day activities at school? I mean, it makes no sense to me. But isn't the right to make those kinds of decisions exactly why our men and women in uniform gave up their lives? We'll discuss that next on Square Off.